I'd like to welcome everyone that's watching my Facebook, website, YouTube, by our app. And uh, we just want to thank you for tuning in, and uh, we hope that you enjoy the service. Come join us live here at the EWC. You're seeing the edited version. Trust me, it's a lot of, enter- a lot of entertainment, the stuff that gets cut out. Some, my wife tells me, don't say that anymore, stuff like that. But anyway, come join us, 1030 on Sundays, Wednesday, 7 p.m. for our, our family night. We have classes for the teenagers, the children, and, of course, the adults and stuff, so we have a good time. So EWC, let's welcome them and thank them for joining us here today. Amen. Amen. Well, here's our theme scripture. You can look above me, look in your word, look on your phone, however you want to do it. A little convenience up there. 1 Peter 2, 9. This is the King James Version. But ye, that is you, ye, look at your neighbor and say ye, ye, ye. 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 Man, it doesn't sound all neat. Yeah. medieval. Me, yeah, ye, okay. But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. And we talked about last week how the author of this uh, scripture started off really good, reminding us how we're chosen, and everybody loves to be chosen, and how we're royalty, and everybody loves to think, oh, we're part of a royal family. Just like the new girl that got married to one of the princes, you know, what's her name, Merkel, Markle, or whatever her name is, that movie star, Megan. You know, she's in a whole different world now. She's part of royalty. You know, a holy nation. And then, then the author takes a, a left turn and calls us peculiar. And we're like, well, thanks. Appreciate that. I was chosen. I was holy. I'm royalty. And now you're calling me weird. You know? And so we don't, you know, we kind of think, well, what's he trying to say here? That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And just kind of a review of that scripture Because last week we found out there's a difference between the Hebrew meaning and the Greek meaning of the word peculiar. And uh, within that, we find that the peculiar in the Hebrew pointed to a possession that was watched over, a possession that was watched over. And then in the Greek, we see that it's focused more on a purchased treasure of great value that was set above other possessions. And so we see a difference here to where once we were... Uh, we were valued. God, we were God's people, and He was watching over us. We saw uh, the Israelites in the wilderness, that God was watching over them. But now we go into the New Testament because Hebrew will always point to the Old Testament, and the Greek will always point to the New Testament. Now we see in a different time in the New Testament or a new uh, generation that Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead, and so now we are purchased. Christ purchased us. He laid down his life for us. He shed his blood for us. He was put in a tomb for us. He rose from the dead for us. Also, he could say, I choose you. Here it is. Paid in full. They belong to me. And so this is what peculiar is talking about. So with that information, last week we combined it with the scripture and found a deeper meaning of just saying chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, a peculiar people. But now we see it in 1 Peter 2, 9, as ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And instead of just peculiar, we see that we're a special possession, which is over and above all else, a purchased treasure of high value that has been shut up and preserved, guarded and saved till the appointed time of God's purpose, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. How many are glad you're peculiar now? Amen. You are a valued treasure that has been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what first Peter was talking about. Not that you're Like the modern-day dictionary says that you're odd, you're strange, you're a freak. That's what today's world says. Because today does look, today's world does look at the church and say we're a bunch of freaks. You can go on the internet, go on YouTube, look up different ministries. They are trashing ministries left and right, left and right, left and right. They praise the NFL for having mansions. They praise the NFL players for having cars and money and cash, and they praise the music world for uh, owning five or six different homes. But they they crucify a preacher that has success. You know, that's how the world is. 
You're a freak. You're odd. You're peculiar. You're a crook. You're all these different things. But we praise the world for what they do. Last week, we talked about one of P.T. Barnum's most famous sideshow performers by the name of Charles Sherwood Stratton, who stood uh, at the um, height of three and a half feet tall by the time he was in his 40s. He was very famous, and we can see a picture of him uh, up here. This was him in some of his uh, performance clothes, and uh, he was, lived to be about 45 years old, I believe. He married and, and had a, a wedding with about 10,000 people in attendance. Uh, his funeral, when he died at the age of 45, uh, had doubled that in attendance of 20,000 people at his funeral. And, and, and Stratton was not just some sideshow freak. He was a, a, a celebrity known around the world. When he signed a contract with P.T. Barnum, he was bringing in a whopping $3.00 with room and board. He was a rock star back then. Amen? And so we talked about him last week, and we talked about come alive. Remember that? We talked about come alive, about coming alive. And we talked about Lazarus, come forth. And, and we kind of um, took the life of, of Charles and the life of Lazarus to see that, you know, sometimes we think things are being cut short. We think things aren't going to work out the way they should. And, and we look at the circumstances. We look at the situations that are involved. And with Charles Stratton, it was a case of his dad, was, how is this boy ever going to be anything in life? How is he ever going to find a wife? How is he ever going to have a life? He was a worldwide celebrity, and he got married with a, a woman that was about an inch taller than him. You know, he, he experienced some things. And so we can't look at the situations. we got to understand that God will prevail, and God will have his will, and God will have his way on our lives. And we can't look at the circumstances. We can't allow the world to, to uh, dominate us and the world to uh, hold us back and hold us down because of inadequacies in our life, yeah. but to allow God to move us forward. So in today's message, I want to introduce you to another member of the Barnum Circus family that quickly became one of the most memorable female sideshow performers, and her name was Annie Jones. You can see a picture of her above me. She obviously was known as the bearded woman. And so you can imagine already the problems with this. You know, when your wife's got a better beard than you, you know, that's, you know, I can't really grow a, one of these Duck Dynasty things that people have today. I just, my wife wouldn't allow it anyway. Um, she'd shave me in my sleep. But, you know, the, 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 you know, the real manly, manly beards that, you know, Mike's got kind of a, 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 a I want that post grown upside down palm tree thing going there. I don't, I don't know what it is, but, you know, it, you know we were in Houston, and, and he was apparently storing food in there because, you know, there was uh, stuff going on. Um, pieces of chicken and, and corn, <laughs> corn nuts and, and stuff like that. I guess that he was saving for later. But, you know, the, Annie, this isn't something. And see, we think a lot of times these sideshows that, oh, they glued it on them. You know, no, what happened was the people would have what we would think of as imperfections in their lives. And they would take them and showcase them. And so Annie grew uh, from birth, she, she had a disease. I, I can't remember the name. It sounds like hair, heritis or something like that, therosis or something like that. I didn't write it down, but she was born in Virginia in 1865. And it was said that when she was born, her chin was completely covered in hair. It's like she came out and had, like me, just kind of a you know, beard on their chin. And you can imagine the shock of her parents seeing their daughter with a beard of a full-grown man coming out of the womb. You know, y'all that have had children, you know, and you're there in the hospital room, and he's like, oh, they're crowning. Oh, I can see their head. It's hair. You know, it was like, oh, and it just kept coming. Oh, there's more hair. You know, there's more, there's more hair. And so, you know, this was a shock to them. And so uh, later on as she grew up, at a, at a year old, Annie's parents, you know, of course, you can imagine they were shocked. They were like, oh, my gosh, my daughter's hairy. You know, she's... She's, she's just, she's got a beard. She's, you know, she's, what are we going to do with her? She's never, here we go again. She's never going to marry. What kind of job is she going to have? You know, all this different stuff of just, oh, my poor child. Oh, poor me. Yeah. And a lot of times we don't consider just what's going on in somebody else's life. We wonder and, and consider what it's, how it's going to affect us. 
And so they were concerned about this. But as they began to hear about P.T. Barnum, their shock and their dismay kind of slowly went away because they had a year old, Annie's parents signed a contract with Mr. Barnum for three years at $150 a week. Yeah, their, their sadness went away pretty quickly. She was promoted as the infant Esau. That sound familiar? Yeah. Esau was uh, Jacob's brother in the Bible, and uh, Esau meant red, it meant hairy, and uh, apparently Esau was covered in hair. Now, whether or not he had this biological uh, condition within him, we don't know, but uh, the Bible does say that he was very hairy all over his body. And so she was promoted as the infant Esau. And she, as she got older, she was known as Esau Lady, and then eventually uh, the bearded uh, lady. And so you go to the next slide, you can kind of see her from different ages here. You know, it never really went away. I was talking to my wife this morning. She said, why don't she just shave it? Men, how many, when you shave it, it does what? Comes back worse. <laughs> it comes back bigger. And so, you know, there wasn't uh, uh, anything she could really do about it. There wasn't a medication or anything she could take back in the 1800s. It was just that was how you were. That's how you were. So Annie Jones became the most memorable of Barnum's acts after a 15-year-long marriage. She got married. In fact, she married a, a gentleman uh, that was called a barker. And no, he wasn't a sideshow person. He wasn't like, rawr, rawr, rawr. you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a dog boy or anything like that. Barker was uh, basically an announcer. He would be the guy that would stand in front of the axe and say, come on, call all, come all, boys and girls of all ages, come see the bearded lady. You know, he was the barker. He was the one that got your attention to come and see the oddities. So after a 15-year-long marriage, Annie would later be the voice of the performers. She would campaign against using the F word, freaks. She wanted to stop that word. She couldn't stand that word. People would call them freaks. People would advertise them as freaks. And it it really uh, did something, and it made her feel less. It made her feel that whatever, and for whatever reason, God allowed this to happen in her body People were coming against her. Have you ever wondered that? God, why did you allow this to be part of my life? And why doesn't people accept it? And why don't other people see it as a blessing but see it as a curse? We could think that about our own lives. And so here she was. She was, I want to get rid of the word freaks. I can't, I can't stand this word freaks. And so she campaigned to get rid of this saying so they could be called sideshow performers. She shortly after that passed away, never um, able to obtain uh, what she was trying to do, but she died at the age of 37 by, of tuberculosis. But even with a great success, marriage, fame, the one thing she desired to change was the, the way others would see her. Forever she would be known as a freak. She never got to be able to change that. She never, be, she never was able to get it through people's minds that she was more than what they saw, more than what was on the outside. Yeah. There was more on the inside. You know, the, the beard, this, this isn't me. This is me. What's in here right. is me. See, because a lot of times we, we base what people do and think about who they are. Mm-hmm. So what I do is I'm a preacher. That's what I do. But do you know who I am? Do you know what kind of person I am? Do you know who I am? Have you spent enough time with me to know my heart? You know, when people look at you, do they just base it on what you do? Or do they take time to get to know you? See, because in, Annie, in Annie's life, she never thought she was enough. She's never enough. And that's the name of today's message, never enough. We go through life thinking we're never enough for people. We're never enough for this world. And we try our hardest uh, to live up to people's expectations. We try our hardest to live up to what they think we should be. Why isn't it enough how God created us to be? And see, the world will even tack things on it because they can't accept who they are. So they start saying that this is how God created me in other things. We look at homosexuality. We look at all these different, well, this is just how God made me. Because you're too scared to accept who you really are. 
you know, we're in a society today where people are trying to pass laws where it's okay to have sex with children. It's disgusting. Trying to okay pedophiles. Saying it's all right, we should pass a law because if you love them, you love them. That's the kind of world we live in. Instead of accepting who God created us to be and get out the junk that the enemy's trying to put within us, because that's what we do, we justify it. Because it's part of our lives, because we allowed something into our lives, we say it's okay. And it's not. It's not. But the devil will come in and say, you're not enough. You, don't, you can't do this. You can't do that. You, 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 you uh, won't succeed and, and you, you, you won't have a, a great marriage or you won't have a great life or you'll never have a great career. Your finances will never be where they need. You aren't enough. But God said, I created you. You are enough. You are enough. I wrote this down. We thought God created us to stand in the shadows when he was actually positioning us to stand in the spotlight. And let me, let me clarify something there. Let, let me let you know that I'm not talking about that God wants you to get the glory. Right. That's right. I'm talking about that God said, it says in his word, it, will, the, will the people not hear unless they have a preacher? Will the people not do this if they don't have a that? You know, it's, God needs someone to stand in the position that he's put them in, and he needs them to go forward to do what he's called them to do. Yeah. Right. But if we're constantly wanting to stand in the shadows, we're constantly wanting to stand in the background and let the enemy lie to us and say we can never achieve what God created us to be, then that's exactly where you'll be the rest of your life, and I promise you, you'll never feel fulfilled. Yeah. Right. I feel my greatest when I'm doing what God's called me to do. Right. Yeah, I'm living, living life. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. But this is when I feel the most alive. Yeah. What is it that God has called you to do and you haven't lived it yet? Good. You haven't walked in it yet. Yeah. I want to bring you a message this morning called Never Enough. 2 Corinthians 2, 7, 9 says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Another version in the message version will say, My power works best in weak people. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. He says, my grace is sufficient. In other words, my grace is enough for you. And because what I have for you is enough, you don't have to listen to the lies that the enemy is trying to tell you you're never enough. See, that's why teenagers today go through a lot of stuff in their own lives because they never feel like they're enough. That's why they go through bulimia. That's why they go through, um, uh, uh, in their minds, they go through these uh, sexual confusion of who they are and what they are and what God created them to be. That's why they go through cutting. That's why they they, uh, mutilate themselves. That's why we have suicides that are rampant. That's why we have runaways. That's why we have gangs, because the enemy has convinced them they're not enough. And that nobody will ever love you. And then as a teenager, you grow into an adult that never got rid of that thought in your mind. And you go through life beating up yourself, saying, what's wrong with me? And why am I not enough? My grace is sufficient. Grace is sufficient. I can't get off that scripture. I can't go to the next slide. My grace is sufficient for you. Paul said, I've got some things going on in my body, and I've asked the Lord. I said, Lord, please take them away. In fact, he said, I, I asked three times. I've always wondered why it was only three. Why didn't he keep on bothering him? Why didn't he keep asking him? Why didn't he keep praying? Why didn't he keep, you know, but he said, I've asked him three times. I guess it was settled in him when God finally said, my grace yeah. is sufficient for you. Well, we don't know what he went through. We don't know what the thorn was. Some, some believe it might have been his eyesight that he couldn't see. And that was a thorn to him. 
Because in one book of the Bible, it says, I wrote this with my own hand, and it was obviously important enough for Paul to, to state that, to let these people know that I wrote this with my own hand, so I really, 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 really mean it. Because yeah. normally I have to have somebody else write it, because without, you know, I, I don't have what I need to be able to, to see. They didn't have glasses back then, so it was like, I, I, I wrote it with my own hand. So maybe that was his thorn in his flesh. Maybe he asked God to heal my eyes. Maybe it was the churches that he established and they were bickering and fighting and always at each other's throats and he was wondering, God, why don't you chill these people out? Whatever it was, it was a burden to him. I think of preachers. That, how many have ever seen preachers that they're anointed to heal? They're anointed to heal. They lay their hands on people and blind eyes open and, and backs are, are made straight and Legs are, are, are straightened out and all these different things. You see God just working through them, but yet that preacher himself has an ailment of his own. Yeah. And you wonder why. Maybe it's to keep them humble. Maybe it's to keep them focused that they're not God. Yeah. They're just a vessel. That's it. Maybe. But what happens is a lot of times that we'll, we'll focus on that. I guess I'm not enough for God to heal. I guess he doesn't love me enough to heal me. You know, I, I don't know what it is, but, you know, sometimes I believe God leaves some things just to keep us humble. But my grace, my grace is sufficient for you. When I think of people in the Bible in preparing this message of who felt like they were never enough, and we could go so many different directions with so many different uh, people. But in, in my eyes, the, the person that would best fit this bill would be young David. Young David. Now, we all know about David. David was a shepherd boy. He uh, had a father by the name of Jesse. Uh, he had a bunch of brothers that were all older from, than him. He was the runt of the family, basically, the youngest. The Bible describes David as um, ruddy and handsome. Yeah, man, he, was, he was red, he was outside all the time, so he was in the sun a lot, and, but he was handsome, he was, uh, um, the Bible specifically points that out, and so different traits, different characteristics of David. And so we see Samuel, the prophet, coming uh, through town because God said it's time to anoint somebody else to be the king, and so he sends him over to Jesse's house. He goes to Jesse, and, and uh, Jesse uh, you know, said, so, you know, what's going on? And he says, well, um, I want to invite all your family to a service to, to talk to you all and to eat and stuff. And he says, all right, cool. My, my whole family, come on, somebody say, my whole family will be there. And so the time came and they, they uh, started talking. talk and Samuel brought each boy before him because Jesse brought his whole family and he said, God wants to anoint the new king. And he stood before one and said, nope. Stood before the next one, said, nope. Stood before the next one. He went down the line, and none of them were king. None of them was what, who God wanted to, to uh, put as king. And so Samuel says, do you have any other sons? Well, there's David. I thought... He invited the whole family. Didn't Samuel say, invite your whole family? But for some reason, Jesse and the other boys didn't even consider David. Because in their eyes, he wasn't enough. Because when he said, what other sons do you have? He said, well, there's David. He's young. He counted him out because of his age. He said he was a boy. So he didn't even see him as a man. And he said, and he's watching the sheep. He's out doing a menial job. I heard uh, one preacher talk about how he wasn't uh, watching over the real sheep. He was watching over the gimp sheep, the little sheep, the non-essential sheep, the ones that if they ran away, who cares? So it's just kind of let's keeping David busy in their eyes. But when really David was being trained in God's eyes. Because if you can be faithful with the small, come on, somebody. If you can be faithful with the small, you'll be trusted over much. But in their eyes, he wasn't enough. He wasn't even enough to invite to the dinner. 
He wasn't even enough to be considered as the next king. The other brothers had a shot. All of them were tall. All of them were handsome. All, all of them looked like a king. Why even invite David? Why bother? See, some of y'all feel like that in your own life. Why bother with me? Why, why bother talking to me? Why bother praying for me? Why, bo- why bother? I'm not enough. And this is how they treated David. And so we, later on we see that uh, Jesse sends David to the front because his brothers were in uh, as soldiers. David wasn't old enough to be a soldier, and so he sent him basically as a delivery boy to go uh, deliver a cheese pizza, basically. It's bread and cheese, right? And so he took all that over there to check on him. But where Jesse was sending him to look after his sons and see how they were doing, God was sending David to confront his future. See, we got to realize that God always has a plan. He got there, and you all know the story. That's why we're not really putting it up on the screen because it's kind of a basic story. But um, he got there, he presented himself before Saul because he heard out they had a giant problem. A giant problem of a giant. Anyway, so uh, he went before him and said, um, hey, king, you know, I'll take care of that for you. And he says, um, you're too young. You're just a boy. Why didn't you stay in the field? It's not enough again. In fact, he told him, he said, um, you're just a boy. He has been training since a boy in the art of war. David, you're not enough. And so here David said, um, let me give you a little rundown, king. Um, I watch after my father's sheep, and I know in y'all's eyes these aren't like major sheep or anything. They're just little sheep, and they're just little runaway, you know, little kick me out of the way type sheep. But, you know, something came, a bear, a lion, they tried to come take my father's sheep, which didn't mean much to him, but they meant a lot to me because that's the position I was put in. And when I know that when I trust little, God will let me trust more. And so I'm going to take care of what seems small in everybody else's eyes. You know, I'm going to run the lights back there like it's a major production. I'm going to run the sound like it's a major concert. I'm going to preach a message like I'm preaching to a thousand because, you know what, I'm going to take care of what everybody else sees as insignificant because to God it's significant for what he wants to do for me in the future. That, that's in a nutshell what David was saying. And he said, I took down the lion and I took down the bear to save the sheep. So the same God, mm-hmm, I always get stuck on that, I always get stuck on that. The same God See, because you might not, you won't always have the same thing coming against you. You won't always have the same situation. You won't always have the same circumstances. You won't always have the same heartache. And you won't have, always have the same problem staring you in your face. But what you always will have is the same God that can help you in times of trouble. And he says, I know it's not a lion and I know it's not a bear. I know it's kind of a, a, a nine-foot giant that's standing before me. But the same God that helped me take them down is what's going to help me take him down. Right. And so we got to realize that. I don't know what you're going through in your life where you feel like you're not enough. Mm-hmm. And maybe you weren't going through it a year ago, but God got you through that thing a year ago. Yeah. Can he not get you through this? Right. Good. I remember my mom went out of the blue. Out of the blue, it seemed like. A report of cancer. A year ago, this wasn't a problem. (laughs) A year ago, this wasn't a situation. But I've known her, and I've known things that have come against her, and I know things that have come against her family, and I know the things that have tried to take us down as a family, but God delivered us from them, and now we have a report that said there's cancer, and my God, it's the same God that helped take down the other things. It's going to be the same God that takes down the cancer. Here we are, I don't, I don't even know how long it's been, three years, cancer-free, cancer-free. Stop telling your God about your problem and start telling your problem about your God. Hmm. You know, we talked about last week, remember, hee-haw, oh, 
whining, complaining, this and that. God, I know you're there. I know you got a plan. I've got this giant before me. God, you know, you know me. I've never fought a giant before. I've never, you know, this guy is nine feet. I've never had to deal with this before. I had to deal with this, but you handled it. So can you handle this? But notice David didn't go back home and say, all right, Saul, nice to meet you, buddy, you know, all this. And um, God's going to take care of that giant for you. Peace. And went home. He said, let me step out from the words that you just called me. (laughs) Yeah, come on. (laughs) Putting him down, telling you just a boy. You don't know what you're doing. This and that. All this mess. Let me get out from behind that and take care of what stands before us. So we can't always just ask God to take care of it and us never have anything to do with it. He needs our obedience. He needs our faithfulness. He needs us to stand up against some things. So then Saul tried to dress him in his armor and all this stuff and didn't fit him. And and, and he was like, you know, man, you know, if you ever tried on a suit and it's too big and it's wrapping around you five times and, you know, and it just doesn't, doesn't fit me. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't hang right. He said, I'm not used to these things. And I love what one version says. It said this. He said, let me fight how I'm used to fighting. (laughs) Let let, let me come at this thing like I know how to come at this thing. And we all know the story. He stood before the giant. The giant thought that he was going to um, do like everybody else and believe the words that were before them, think that they're not enough, go run and hide. But David did something different. David charged at the giants. He didn't stand in one place and throw something at him. He didn't stand in one place and just cuss him out and try to intimidate him. But he said, I charged at him. And then he does the unbelievable. Instead of just charging, now all of a sudden he's weaponized while he's charging and while he's running. And the, the, the stone that he put in it then now connects with him in the forehead and takes the giant down. Where everybody else said you're not enough, David conquered what everybody said he wasn't enough to conquer. You have in you what God has placed in you to be able to conquer what's in front of you. Instead of, and see, this is the problem. We want to stand there and have a conversation with the giant. See, and David, David had a short one. You know, how, you know, how, how could you send a boy to do a man's job? You know, because he kept saying, send me a man, send me a man. How degrading is that? You know, Frank, if I came up to you and I said, you know, I stood here and said, all right, somebody come up, I need a man. And you start coming up, I said, sit down, I need a man, I need a real man. With that kind of, you know, you'd be like, all right, let me show you a real man. You know, you know, so, and so you know, that's, what, that's what Goliath was doing. Send me a man. He's looking over at David, send me a man. David got righteously indignant. He said, how dare you? Come against my God. I love how David takes the insults that were slung at him and takes them personal about his God. That's good. Yeah. Because it wasn't about who he was. Because in our natural self, no, we're not enough. No, we can't do anything. But with God within us, and God is for us. And yeah. if God is leading us, you know, right. when you come against me, you're coming against my... Come on, how many have ever told somebody, when you talk about me, you're talking about my whole family? Yeah, you know y'all are like that. You said, what about grandma? (laughs) Don't talk about granny. She's a good woman, you know. That's how it was. It was like, how dare you talk about my God like that? Because when you put me down, you put down the creator. Hmm. See, because the enemy wants you to believe that you're not enough. You're not enough. And in life, a lot of times, he, he'll lie to you and make you believe that you don't have enough support. 
You don't have enough people backing you. You don't have enough family or friends that would support you along the way. And he lies to you and said, nobody's for you. Everybody's against you. How could you ever succeed in life? And that's how he tries to make you feel. He did a number on me. He tried to work on me when we started this church. And I was like, nobody's going to come. Nobody's going to come hear an ex-youth pastor preach. Nobody's going to come and support this ministry. Nobody's going to be a part of it because God was telling me, don't you dare call one person. Don't you dare contact one person. Don't you dare send a text or an email. or Don't, don't, you, da- don't you dare. I want to show you that I'm behind this. That I'm the one building this. And so you know how hard that was for me? And so the devil was lying. It's like, nobody's going to come because you're not allowed to invite anybody. (laughs) He was working on me. The devil wants to tell you that you don't have enough support. You don't have enough support. Nobody even thought of to call you in from the field. Hmm. Nobody thought you'd even be good enough to be king. Nobody even wanted to give you a chance or a shot. My gosh, at least pour the oil on me or anoint, you know, put your hand on me, pray for me. At least stand before me and tell me if I'm not good enough. Don't you hate when you go for a job interview and they said, we'll call you, and they don't? Yeah. Nobody supports you. Nobody likes you. That's how David was feeling. Y'all laughing a little too much at that. that just let you know that's hurting my feelings. Anyway, Roman. <laughs> I'm not getting any support in this message right now. Just go sit in the corners. <laughs> All alone. Okay. Romans 8, 31 through 39. Look at this. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son. Ooh, come on. That ought to free somebody right there. When you think you're not enough, God said, I gave up my only son for You're enough. You're worth it. That I told my son to go lay on a cross and give up his life. And yes, he had a free will, and that should make it even more to you that God would want to give up his son and that his son would agree to it. You're enough. You're enough. God says, I love you, and you're enough. Who can ever be against you? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, Won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? My gosh, there it is again, that he's chosen for his own. Uh, Who who dares accuse us whom God are his peculiar people that he, he, he possesses? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? See, I was, reading, I was studying this, and I was reading it, uh, Joel. I was reading it, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to put these verses down. I kept reading, and I was like, oh, i got to put these. So we got the, a bunch of scriptures right here. Look at this. And who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised for life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Amen. Do you hear all those us's? Yeah. Do you hear them? That he, he, he will not condemn us. He died for us. He raised a life for us. He's sitting in the place of God on the right hand pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? Or, pers- or if we're persecuted or we're hungry or we're destitute or we're in danger or threatened with death? In other words, when things come against us, does that mean that he's given up on us? No. Never. It says, as the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And I am convinced. Oh my gosh, Paul had to have been through some things to be able to even put those words down that say, I am convinced something happened in his life, some trials he went through, some different things. The Bible talks about how he was shipwrecked, that he was in the ocean, he was naked, he was hungry, he was all these different things, how he was uh, uh, beaten for the gospel of Jesus Christ, how he was snake-bitten. He had went through so many different things. So he has the right to stand here and say, I am convinced. 
that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons. He starts going down this list of fears for today, nor worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. He goes from the heights of the heavens to the bowels of hell to let you know nothing can separate you. No power in the sky above or in the earth below indeed. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Don't tell me you don't have enough support when the very heavens stand behind you and cheer you on. You can do this. You can accomplish this. You can be victorious even when things are coming against you and they don't go the way you thought they'd go. God says you are still victorious because I support the path that you're on. Hmm. You have enough support. I love the lyric of that song. In the first part it says, I'm not a stranger to the dark. Hide away, they say, because we don't want your broken parts. I've learned to be ashamed of all my scars. Run away, they said. No one will love you as you are. But I won't let them break me down to dust. And I know that there's a place for us, for we are glorious. The world tries to beat you down. The world says you can't do it. The world tries to dress you like you're not used to. And I'm not talking about clothes. I'm just talking about the things in your life. They try to put this on you and label on you and this and that and that. And I just don't feel right would you please let me live the way I'm used to would you please let me live the way God wants me to will you please let me fight the way I'm used to fighting Hmm. support is not measured by those that applaud the idea but by those who stand with you throughout the process that's support we had a lot of people tell us oh great and awesome Starting a church. About time, Corey. Haven't heard a word from them since. But those that come, <laughs> those that, 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 that show up, and those that have put a wall up, and those that have hung a light, and those that have painted yeah. you know, this and laid this down and hung this up and done that and done that, that's support. That's right. I've said it before. A lot of people want to come and eat the corn, <laughs> but not everybody wants to help plant it. Grow it, shuck it, cook it, put some butter on it that's dripping and it's coming. Come on, somebody, anybody ready for lunch? That's support. That's support. The devil will lie to you, not only say you don't have enough support, but that you don't have enough faith. You don't have enough faith. Jesse sent David to the front lines. He says, you can't do this. You can't, you, you don't have enough in you to succeed. Romans 12, 3 says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. Mm-hmm. King James Version will say this, that he has given you a measure of faith. Yeah. It doesn't say in there that certain people get a measure of faith. It says that everyone has been given a measure of faith. And what I love about that is that it says that if you have faith as the size of a mustard seed, come on, somebody, small faith. It says if you have the small faith, you can move large things. It says that you can tell a mountain to be gone and throw itself into the sea. You know, it's saying you just need the measure of faith. Yes, through your journey and through your life, your faith will grow according to what you place it in and see things happen. You'll begin to see, oh, God does move when I have faith. That headache went away. I've had my son pray for me. And in all his innocence, and he just, you know, well, mom and dad says that if I pray, it'll go away. I've had him pray for headache, and within less than five minutes, it's gone. The faith of a child, the faith of the innocent. 
And so what a lot of times happens is we get our own thinking in the way and our doubts and our situation and, uh, oh, this is too big and this ain't a little headache, Pastor. You don't know what I'm going through. God says if you have a little faith, you can tell a mountain to be removed and it shall throw itself into the sea. Whatever is blocking you, whatever is in your way, yeah. have faith. Yeah. So the next part of the song says, another round of bullets hit my, hit my skin. Well, fire away, because today I won't let the shame sink in. We are bursting through the barricades and reaching for the sun. We are warriors. Yeah, that's what we've become. (laughs) It's what we've become. Where once we were just the shepherd boy. Come on, somebody. We were once in the fields. We were once watching the gimp sheep. But God called us forward. And before we know it, we're on the front lines, given a choice. Are you going to stand before your giant or are you going to turn around and go home? Are you going to let other people tell you you can't get past this? Are you going to let other people tell you that, oh, it's just over? Are you going to let other people tell you the outcome? Or are you going to stand before it and say, I believe he can do it? The devil says you don't have enough faith. But God says, I've given you a measure. Yeah. It's in you. Right. Are you going to utilize it? Yeah. Our measure of faith was not given to intimidate each other's journeys, but to encourage growth along the way. Yeah. So I don't like when people say, well, you don't have enough faith. And they build up their own. Say, so, well, look, look what I can do. Look what God does through me. He doesn't do it through you. Now, that's, that's not building each other up. Right. Last one, look at this. The devil will lie to you and say, you don't have enough experience. You're not enough. You're not enough. You don't have enough experience. You know, David, David was in the field getting experience. Well, how's that, Pastor? Well, yeah, the lion and the bear and all that. But you've got to understand something about these guys. This wasn't some Opie Taylor with a slingshot. Y- y'all know who Opie Taylor, or am I just showing my age? Come on, somebody. You know, Opie, you know, Ron Howard, you know, multi-billionaire uh, uh, director. You know, back then he was just Opie with slingshot. This wasn't Opie with a slingshot. This was, these guys, they actually had a name for them. They were called slingers. And these guys could knock a, a can off of a, a post tons of feet away. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not good at yardage and all that, but, I mean, just way down there, they could just twirl. And it wasn't this. It was, it was this, and they could nail it. It was something they practiced in. It was something. He wasn't just out in the field with his harp. Blung, blung, blung. He was out there practicing. He was out there practicing. He didn't know why he was practicing. Yeah, he know he had lions and bears and tigers, oh my, coming at him. But, you know, the, 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 he, but something within him knew that, you know, God knew what was down the road. He said, you better keep practicing. You need some more experience. Because Saul said, you don't have enough experience. But he's been trained in the art of war. Oh, no, Mr. King, I'm sorry. But I've been out in the field. Right. That's good. That's good. Practicing. Getting experience. See, while everybody else was out ruining their lives, you were in the field. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hebrews thirteen twenty says, Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus and the great shepherd of the sheep and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you. Come on, somebody say that with me. Say, equip you. Say it again. One, two, three. Equip you with all you need for, you, his well, for doing his will. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. His will. He will equip you in what you need to do his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. I love the word equipped because it means furnished. He's furnished you with everything that you need. So God furnishes us. He puts within us what we need. There's things and abilities within each one of us that differ from everybody else. And he knows why he put them there. And some of us have never even 
Some of us have never even stepped into that room yet that's been furnished. It's beautiful. He's furnished it. It looks perfect, but you even haven't even bothered to go in there yet to see what it's all about because you're so bound by obstacles of what people have said and how people see you. My gosh, you carry it around with you all the time. All the time, everywhere you go, everywhere you go, you can't get past it. You, you, you can never get past those things because you always just have it in front of you. And it's just as heavy as this thing. And it's like, oh, I can't get rid of this thing. Just step out. Leave it behind you. I don't care what they have to say about me. I don't care the accusations about me. I don't care. I know what I'm doing, and I know how I stand before God, and I know about His will and His ways, and I'm trying to walk in them as best as I can, and I never said I was perfect, but somebody, would you please get it in your mind that this is me. I never feel enough. I never feel like, I'm the best husband, and I never feel like I'm the best dad, and I never feel like I preach the best message, and I never feel like I'm good enough, but I know because God who lives in me, I am enough.